So in this part, we're going to talk about kernel exploitation and more specifically about the type of bugs you can find in, in the kernel. It can be from null difference bugs to use after free, integer overflow, buffer overflows, and memory information disclosure. Okay, let's get started. So typically the end goal is either to get code execution in the kernel or to do a data only attack. A lot of the time nowadays, the goal is sandbox breakout because exploit people are using are first getting code execution into the browser or other client side applications that are sandboxed. And the sandbox breakout might involve getting kernel code execution. So for instance, get, getting an erupt chain executed into the kernel or shell code executed into the kernel. Since that is basically giving you any capability you want, such as installing a rootkit or then trying to attack the hypervisor or even targeting any privileged user and process like Elsass. A data-only attack typically is used for local privilege escalation where you modify data in kernel structures, for example, to patch some process token, typically your own process token to a higher privilege token. And so you never actually get shell code executed in, in the kernel. But the result is that your process has system privileges, which are the highest privileges you can have for user and process. And so technically, system privileges is less privileges than kernel privileges. But this is sometimes all you need to do to be able to do whatever you want on that machine. What you are looking for when you're exploiting almost any memory corruption kernel bugs is building arbitrary read-write primitives. So having some way to read kernel memory and write kernel memory, preferably as much memory as possible. And ideally, you want to be able to read that memory from any base address if possible. And that's the arbitrary part. And if not possible, you want to be able to do it from some useful kernel base address, at least. And that's generally the first thing you approach when you're exploiting any memory corruption bugs is you want to build that arbitrary read-write primitive. Null dereferences used to be a very common kernel vulnerability type that could be exploited. A lot of the null dereferences bugs, and we can shorten that to null deref bugs, are still being found these days, but they can't really be exploited anymore due to the fact that you can't allocate the null address, which is the address at zero. And so the idea for exploiting this kind of bug is that you could trigger some kernel code path where it fails to check some pointer before it accesses it. And so basically it differences the pointer that was null. And so to exploit that before triggering that kernel code, you would typically allocate your own data in New Zealand at that null page at address zero. And so you could provide a fake kernel structure that is effectively New Zealand memory. And a lot of the time, what would happen is there would be a function pointer in there and you could just get the kernel to execute your own code from New Zealand while it's in kernel mode and you're done basically. Back in the day, you could write your exploit for like in a day. But basically, SMAP mitigated that at first by forbidding the kernel mode to execute memory for user land. And then since Windows 8, Windows was changed to make sure you can't allocate addresses from the bottom 65k when you're in New Zealand. And so what is interesting about this null deref bugs is that nowadays, because of the fact that you can't allocate the null page, these bugs are basically a class of bug that can't be exploited at all anymore. And so on the latest version of Windows, you can't exploit any new difference bug. And so Microsoft chose not to fix these bugs anymore because by design, they are not exploitable. And so finally, it's worth saying that there has been one or two vulnerabilities where people managed to actually get memory they control allocated near the new address on recent Windows 10. And so this rendered the new differences bugs all of a sudden exploitable again, which only lasts a quite period of time because obviously these bugs were patched after they were reported to Microsoft. The most common bug class in the Windows kernel these days is use after free, which is basically the same as when you have a use after free bug in New Zealand. But basically what will happen is that in fairly complex code bases, what you can find is multiple code paths that keep a reference to the same object. 
And so what happens is one of them frees the object, but then the other one, the other cut path accesses the object after it has been freed. And so to exploit that vulnerability, you would typically trigger the first cut path to free the object, and then you would find a way to allocate something you control in that previously freed chunk. And so here it, it would be dependent on the pool used by the target object. So if you are on the non-page pool, you could spray certain types of object to populate memory that you wouldn't be able to do on the non-page or on the page pool and vice versa. And so once you have replaced that freed object, you would then trigger the second path to reuse the object. But this time you could control its contents. So during the use after free, you would typically have some kind of primitive that you could abuse when the kernel code executes. So generally you are looking for the ability to allocate things on the pool with a control size and you want to be able to do it on demand. You want to be able to allocate whatever you want and also sometimes you want to be able to free it whenever you want. Also generally you want to control as much data as possible in that total size you are able to allocate. So the process of doing all of that is typically called pool feng shui. And so generally what will happen is that to exploit the, these use after freeze, you find some cut path that you use the now freed memory in an interesting way that can often lead to overflows. So for instance, if it has previously validated some length field in, in the structure, but now you can provide any large lengths. So when this cut path executes, it assumes the length field is correct, but then some overflow happens. Another possibility is it accesses certain pointers that it thinks are in kernel, but you're actually making them point to userland with your own fake data. And so typically if you're able to craft an object with a pointer and length, so the pointer would be data, the kernel return to userland like a description field or a string, and the length would be the length of that field. And so if you're lucky, there is a Windows userland API that allows to get that description field. And so typically if you call that API, what the kernel would do is to copy the data from that field in kernel by checking its length first and then copying the amount of bytes from a kernel to userland so you can read it from userland. But now, because you have corrupted that pointer and that length, basically the kernel will give you any data from any address of the size you want and you effectively get an arbitrary read-write primitive. And so, yeah, it's definitely the most common type of rarity you encounter in the kernels these days, even on, on operating systems like Linux or OS X. There are also lots of integer overflows and just other overflow type bugs. They can be sometimes harder to exploit because of context specific constraints. For example, sometimes the data you, you can use during the overflow is not fully controlled or it is limited in size, so you can't actually overflow a lot of data. Another bug class that is increasingly common just because a lot of low hanging fruits are being removed is race conditions. And so race condition problems have often existed for a long time and are more complicated than other types of bugs, but they are also sometimes harder to trigger or find due to specifics like timings or you need to create the right state to be able to win the race condition. And so typically the race condition is the bug, but the end result often leads to something like a use after free or a bad length check. And there are also some logic only race condition problems, but that's not so common in the kernel in general. Aside from use after free problems, maybe the most other useful bug class are memory information exposure bugs, where you are basically leaking the contents of kernel memory to userland that you should not be able to do so. A lot of people refer to it as memory information disclosure, but some people refer to it as memory leak, which is just unfortunate because if you look up kernel memory leak on the internet, you are going to find a bunch of information about drivers, writers that forget to free pointers or to free memory in general, which are not security vulnerabilities per se. They are just programming bugs because they are forgetting to free pointers. And then basically what happened is the drivers end up taking too much memory over time, which we call memory leaks as well. And so what happens is the drivers slowly exhaust kernel memory and it crashes the system or whatever. These types of bugs, like the memory disclosure bugs, are really common and really, really useful because 
now that there are things like Canon SLR that randomize the Canon memory, you can basically use these additional bugs like memory information disclosure bugs to bypass Canon SLR. And a lot of the time, if you try to exploit a user for free or race condition bugs or other types of bugs, you won't be able to disclose addresses using that particular bug. So you often need a separate bug. So typically you'll use a memory disclosure bug on top of your other bug like user for free. Another thing worth noticing is that sometimes these memory disclosure bugs only allow you to leak the address of one of the kernel module, like win32k.sys, but not ntoskernel.exe or vice versa, or only an address of an object from the pool. And so depending on what you can leak, it kind of dictates what you can or can't do with it. But yeah, it's really common to get this kind of bug in modules like win32k. An example is if you have uninitialized memory in data structures that are then copied to userland and returned to userland, you will be able to leak some potential kernel pointers. We won't talk about logical only issues here because we are mainly interested in memory corruption vulnerabilities. One of the hardest part of exploitation, I guess, in general with regards to kernel bugs is figuring out how to build good primitives because a lot of the time the constraints of the bugs are really annoying or it's not really clear what you can do with it or you know there is a bug but you don't know well enough the code you are looking at yet to really know how to abuse it and what it lets you do in the kernel. So when I say finding good primitives, what I mean is that for instance you have a memory overflow on the heap and so the question is what do we do with that? Sure, we want to execute code in the kernel but there may be no function pointer to override due to a limited overflow. And even if there was a function pointer, we would not be able to know what replacement function address to use because we can't just redirect it to userland due, due to mitigation like SMAP. So like we said earlier, we want to build an arbitrary read-write primitive in general, but to build that, we may have to build intermediate primitives like a relative read primitive which would be a read from a kernel pointer that we don't control. So we would just leak what is after a kernel pointer, but without controlling that pointer. And so after we leak the data, we would know more about the kernel itself, like where it is located. Also, we may leak addresses of controlled object we spread in memory using heap entry. And so basically we would get basic exploitation primitives first. And with manual efforts, we would get better and better primitives until we reach our arbitrary read-write primitive goal. And most of the time to find all these basic and more complicated primitives, it involves reversing the Windows kernel code related to the bug, but also reversing all the parts of code not related to the bug, but that could be invoked from username to achieve our goal. So there might be ways using some other components to build your primitives. So I have previously said that you don't need to know that much about the kernel and how all the components work in advance in general. But here is the exception. So there are times where you just run into dead ends looking at the components, trying to find ways to use the bug to build your good primitives. And basically you'll have to start poking around and look at more and more code until you find ways to build these powerful primitives. And this could be in other completely different parts of the kernel. So in general, having some fundamental knowledge about the kernel is good because it's it up. And so if you run into a problem like this that you need to solve, then it's a good time to read more about the Windows kernel internals. Like for instance, reading a book like Windows internals and just read that in general. If you were reading something like Windows internals beforehand, it would be too much information. You would not spark any good ideas and you would forget a lot of information. But here you have a problem that you are looking for a solution. So while you're, you read all of that information, you'll be looking for very specific stuff. And also this will bring ideas into what you're reversing, specific patterns or method that you could apply to other parts of the code. And so once you know the kind of constraints you're dealing with with your bug, the good thing is to spend quite a bit of time studying internals from existing papers, blogs, reading previous exploits, reversing the kernel. And so yeah, in general, if you're interested in this type of work, you may want to check the exploitation 4011 after you finish all the Windows internals material.